So understand the user. And then find a way of structuring the problem. This is really important because a lot of this, these questions are about structure and communication. So find a way of structuring the problem that so they prevents you from sort of going you know, off the wall and talking about this feature and this one and this one and this one. So maybe it's, you, you say, okay, I'm going to come up with a set of core functionalities that, that are going to be required, and then we talk about uh, how you do different solutions to input and output. So whatever it is, find a way of structuring the problem. And then you outline your structure to the interviewer, and then you actually go and you solve it piece by piece. And you finalize with sort of a wrap up of here's sort of the high level overview of what my, problem, what my solution is. So that's product design questions. The next type is estimation questions. So these are the common questions you've heard about them are you know, things like how many golf balls will fit in a 747, uh, how many pieces are delivered every year in New York, things like that. Now, you, if you look online, if you and you, you might see, even like places like the Wall Street Journal has written articles about like, they came out with an article in this last December about like crazy Google interview questions and Business Insider does a ton of these articles. Uh, don't look at these articles; they are almost always complete lies. Uh, I'm not joking. They the the quest, list of questions that they off that they say are Google questions are ne are not Google questions. Uh, the whole long story of how these questions came about, became, became known as Google questions. There are Google questions, don't listen to them. Uh, the exception of the only questions that you'll see listed on these websites uh, or that are actually real are these estimation questions. The thing with the estimate, estimation questions is that it's not, it's not about knowing the answer. So people get really scared about this because they think that they have to know how many you know, pizzas are delivered every year in New York. Of course not. Right? But these questions are about are two things. First of all, problem solving. And then secondly, just basic quantitative skills. So in many ways, if you know how to if you know how to solve these problems, you know what they're sort of expecting, what they're looking for, how you're being evaluated, they can actually be some of the easiest questions to do well on. So remember, just remember it's it's at its core it's problem solving quantitative skills. It's not getting getting the right answer. It's just showing how you solve a problem. So the way you approach a question. And so let's suppose you have a question like, how much money does Gmail make in ads every year? So the way you approach this question is, first of all, ask questions. OK, you said, how much money? Do you mean revenue or profit? Uh, you said Gmail. Do you mean uh, like just gmail.com, or do you mean the like, hosted Gmail for your domain? So ask questions. Make sure you actually understand what they're solving. And then find a structure. So and th th this is a really, really important part of the problem. So for this problem, you might do something like, OK, well, I'm going to estimate first how many users Gmail has. And then I'm going to estimate the clicks per user per year. And then I'm going to estimate the dollars, the average dollars per click. And if I, can, if I can guess at each of those three numbers, then I have my answer. I just multiply those per year together, right? Number of users times dollars per user times clicks, uh, dollar, sorry, number of users times clicks per dollar. Uh, Yes, I'm <laughs> uh, Yes, number of users times clicks per user is dollars per click. Uh, so you, get, you have those, you multiply them together, you have your answer. So then solving this, these problems is, okay, now how do you figure out how many users you have? So you break down, you break down these components. You make some reasonable assumptions. So you, you might say things like, okay, well, let's see, there's 300 million people in the U.S., and let's suppose, I don't know, 80% of those people use email. Okay, so that, that gives, you know, however many users. And then, okay, so 80% use email. Well, maybe, you know, how many of these people have a personal email account? But, as opposed to, say, a work account. Uh, well, okay, let's say, I don't know, 60% of people, 70% of people have a personal email account. Okay, well, how many of those is going to, or what percentage of the people do you think use one of the major email providers? So, Hotmail, Gmail, et cetera. And you just go through this and you, you kind of take guesses. Yeah, you kind of just pull the numbers out of thin air, but you, you make some reasonable guesses. You round the numbers, state your assumptions explicitly, and then you come out with some estimate of the number of users. And then you do that for each part. And as you can see, these aren't terribly scary. You're just making reasonable assumptions and breaking down the problem. And then finally, you get some number. And then you do a sanity check. As you kind of think about, does, does this number make sense? So suppose you get something like $16 billion for Gmail's annual, uh, annual revenue. 
you think about, okay, does this, does this number basic, you know, suppose that's just the U.S. Does this number basically make sense? Well, if you just think about the number, you think about $16 billion and the U.S. population is only 300 million people, that's a lot of money for a person. And that's, that's if every single person in the U.S. used Gmail. So that number is wild, just you have to know it's wildly, wildly off. And that's okay. So you get some of you wildly off, and then you just go through and you think about, okay, well, where did I make the crazy assumptions? Maybe my number for Gmail users, you know, you came out with 100 million people, say, for Gmail users, and you're like, wait a minute, that's three, it's a third of the US. That doesn't sound right. And so you break this down and you try to figure out where did you go wrong. And that's all estimation questions are. They're just problem solving quantitative skills, being organized here, taking notes as you do it. So you can, you know, revert, you know, backtrack through your work. It's going to be really important. So that, the, so that's how you do those like crazy Google questions that are like, you know, how many golf balls in the SUV? And you make estimations for the size of the truck, the way that golf balls are set, and that's all you have to do. That's how you do estimation questions. And then the final type I want to talk about is so the coding, the algorithms, and so the real technical questions. So the way you solve these sort of questions are again asking questions. You'll see this consistently. Is it a lot of these questions, the first thing you should do when you're asked to solve a problem, regardless of what type of problem it is, is ask questions to make sure you actually understand what the person is looking for. And then talk out loud, show the interviewer how you think. Some people have this idea that the first thing out of their mouth should be the right answer, and that's just crazy. There's no way you'll be able to do that. Just, you, know, you get some problem, talk to your interviewer about, okay, well, see, you could solve it the brute force way like this, it has these drawbacks, okay, how can we improve it? So you talk out loud, and eventually you get, you know, you work on it, you iterate through the problem, you think about it, eventually you get some, some, some algorithm. And then you think critically, like, does this really work? Be open with your interviewer about what the trade-offs are of your approach. Maybe it works really well for one, for one set of, if the data looks like one thing, but it doesn't work well in another case. Make sure you be open with the interviewer about those trade-offs. So what some candidates try to do is they think that, that you know, they kind of know that their algorithm doesn't work in these cases, and they kind of think that if they just don't reveal that to their interviewer, their interviewer won't know. When you've asked the same question to dozens of candidates, you have seen every approach out there. You know exactly what the trade-offs are, and you know exactly when someone's writing code what the issues will be with that solution. So you know, if you're a candidate and you're trying to hide that from the interviewer, it's not going to really get to work. Be able to the interviewer, make sure that they know that you know what the issues are. And then actually go and write code. So slowly and methodically is key. Don't, don't try to race. It's, it's not a race. We're not judging how quickly your hand can move across a whiteboard. Just, you know, take your time. People do not get rejected really for writing code too slowly. They do get rejected for making, you know, making too many mistakes and taking too long to come up with the final solution because they're making a lot of mistakes because they can't think clearly through the problem. But it's not really about how quickly your hand can move across the whiteboard. So don't try to race here. And then really, really important, you get to the end of the problem, your code is done, test your code. Make sure it really works. Uh, what, what I would hate is candidates who would finish writing the last curly brace and then they turn around and they'd be like, ta-da, I'm done. <laughs> and this is like the interview equivalent of somebody who you know, just writes code and then just submits it without testing. Right? Like you don't want to hire those people. So you don't want to, you want to make it clear to your interviewer that you understand that you'll, you will very likely have bugs in any piece of code that you write because you just will and that you're, you're okay with testing it. And so you test your code, you just run it through by hand, uh, you, you know, trace through, walk through the code, and when you get mistake, when you find a bug, which you will, uh, it's really, really important here, actually think through why your bug happened. So you, know, you, you'd run, you trace your code through and you realize that uh, your code returns one instead of two for some particular value. Don't just add plus one. And, and I see a lot of candidates do this. And so they, add, you know, they do, you know, they do the problem of like adding plus one to the return value, and then they test again, and then of course it has some other problems. And pretty soon they wind up with all this code that's like, it was way better before they did anything. So don't be that person. Make a bug. I mean, that's that's normal. Uh, just think through what actually happened. Where did it go wrong? Don't just try to fix the final value. That's that's, you know, coding questions. So how do you actually come up? Or the next thing is. What does it mean to actually write good code? So it does matter. First of all, code in the top left hand corner of the whiteboard. Far top, like all the way up there. Uh, not down here. People like to start writing code like right here. Far left corner. Uh, 
You're will, you will need the entire whiteboard. Top left corner, trust me. Um, and keep your handwriting pretty small if you can. Try to keep it straight. We'll have this line yeah. tendency to go like yeah. this. <laughs> um, I mean, we're not going to hold it against you, but it'll make it a lot more annoying for you. So top left corner, keep your writing pretty small and pretty straight. Uh, pseudocode first, if necessary. And the, this is a really something I, I hesitate to tell people because uh, I want to be very clear that the, in the vast majority of inter interviewers will tell you different things, but the vast majority of interviewers, from what I found, do not like pseudocode. Um, and do not like pseudocode as the final thing. Meaning that I, if I'm viewing someone's code, or if I want somebody to write code in this interview, I want to eventually see actual real code with all those semicolons and all that in place. Uh, and people who write pseudocode, it, for a lot, a lot of interviewers read it as a, like, the candidate isn't comfortable writing real code. And it's kind of trying to get away with hiding stuff. They don't really understand syntax well. It's not a lot of interviewers have a bias uh, against people who write pseudocode as, and only write pseudocode. So it's really, really important that you do write eventually real code. Uh, that said, it's perfectly fine to sketch out and write pseudocode if it helps you. But the one thing I'd say here is that make sure you tell your interviewer, hey, I'm going to start off writing pseudocode first, and then I'm going to write real code. Because you don't want your interviewer to have that like knee jerk, like, oh, it's one of those candidates. <laughs> right? So make sure your interviewer knows that you're going to write real code. Uh, if pseudocode helps you to write first, that's fine. If it doesn't, don't worry about it. Um, again, be methodical, don't rush. Reasonably bug free. Uh, any sort of medium, hard, or difficulty problem is going to have some bugs. It's OK. Uh, it, it was very rare for even someone who gets hired to, and I was not the hardest interviewer at Google. I wasn't an easy one, but I was, you know, I was probably like the 60th, 70th percentile. Uh, it was unusual to have people <coughs> who got hired actually write their code in my interview without bugs. So, like, don't, don't freak out because you make one mistake. Uh, if you don't make one mistake, that's actually doing really well. So, you know, bugs are okay. Uh, obviously, fewer bugs better. But, uh, and then clean code it. So use other functions as much as you. You want to. The key here is you want to show your interviewer that you are an organized, clean coder. You think about maintainability. You understand that other people kind of read your code. That you you, you care about these things. So use other functions as much as possible, or as, you know, as much as it's useful. Use data structures when necessary. Uh, or define your own when it's useful, uh, and just you know, do what you can to show that you're, you care about writing concise code, readable code, maintainable code. Right. So now we're going to talk about how to actually approach and solve the tough algorithm questions. So there's a couple of approaches I found for coding algorithms questions. The, uh, so I'm going to talk about those sort of four approaches. So first of all, pattern matching. Pattern matching is sort of the one that we all kind of know about, even though you may have heard it labeled. So pattern matching means to basically look at a problem and think, what does this sound similar to? So if you're asked to reverse the order of words in a sentence, well, uh, you know, so, the, so this is got dogs are cute. You want to have be a to have error So sorry, dogs are cute. You want to be cute are dogs. So the first thing you want to do is think, OK, well, this kind of sounds similar to just reversing a string. So you just if you just reverse the string, then you get air to air as a guide. And then you do that, and you think, well, if I then just reverse each individual word, then I have my answer. So I reverse the entire string, air to air as a guide. And then I reverse each word, and I get cute R dogs. So that's pattern matching. Just you know, what problems this sound similar to? And this is why preparation is really important. Because the more, prep, the more you prepare, the more you'll be able to actually think this problem sounds similar to this other one. So the next approach is simplify and generalize. And what this approach means is you hear a problem, you don't know how to solve it, you simplify, you tweak some of the constraints, and see if then you can solve this modified problem. So as an, as an example, there's a famous problem called the ransom note problem. And what this problem means is you think about, you know, you have a ransom note, which is an array of strings, and a magazine that is an array of strings. And you want to basically cut words out of the magazine to build this ransom note. So the question is, how do you, how do you figure out if a particular ransom note can be built from a particular magazine? So suppose you look at this and you don't know how to solve this. Or the, you know, one constraint you might change is, well, what if we weren't cutting out words and we were cutting out characters instead? 
So we're just changing some of the problem. Well, if you had this, this, and you can think, well, then I just need to count, do I have enough A's? Do I, you know, how many A's do I need? I need five A's? Okay, do I have five A's? I need five B's? Do I have five B's? And so you could do this by going through the ransom note, counting, okay, I need five A's, I need seven B's, I need three C's, I need two E's. And then you go through the magazine, you check, do you have all that covered? So that's the, the so that's how you do it if it was a, you know, if it was a, if you're just cutting out characters. So you build an array of character frequencies. So now we go back up to the real problem and say, okay, now we have a ransom note and we're built cutting out words. What do we do? Well, it's actually very similar. Rather than counting, do we have enough, you know, A's, B's, etc., we just count, do we have enough apples, do we have enough dogs, do we have enough, you know, cats, whatever. So we build a hash table that maps from each word to the number of times that word appears. And we check in the ransom note, check that we have enough words in the magazine to cover each word in, in the ransom note. So that's simplify and generalize. So you simplify or tweak some of the constraints, and you try to solve the simplified problem and see if that'll help you solve the broader problem. The next approach is what's called uh, base case and build. And base case and build means to basically solve it for so that you know, the, the base cases, so n equals 1, n, equal, you know, n equals 0, n equals 1, maybe n equals 2. And then see if you can solve it for the broader problem. So suppose you had this question that is, print all subsets of a set. So the, you know, n equals 0 case, okay, so it's just, that's just an empty set. Uh, all other stuff that is just an empty set. Subsets of um, set, you know, just a is empty set in a, and it's still kind of easy. So we're still kind of in the base case zone. Subsets of A and B, still pretty trivial. Just empty set A, A empty set A, B, and A, B. Okay, now, subsets of A, B, and C get a little bit more interesting. It's a little bit less uh, easy to just, a little less, a little, less no, a little harder to spit out the right answer here. So now, here's a good problem to think, okay, can we build all subsets of A, B, and C from any, any or all of the prior so we might look at this and think, okay, well, the only difference between A, B, and C and A, B is just the presence of C, which means that any subset in, anything in the subset of A, B, and C that contains a C is not going to be this prior answer. Anything that doesn't contain a C will be this prior answer. So what we can do is we can take all subsets here. All subsets of this are going to be of A, B, and C, and then we just need to add C as well. So we take this copy all of these to the subsets, and then we add C. So you have C, A, C, B, C, and A, B, C. This is a you know, pretty straightforward recursive algorithm to, to write. We want to find S of n. Okay, compute S of n minus 1 recursively, and then clone that answer and add n to all the clones. So that's base case and build, and it tends to lead to pretty nice recursive algorithms. And the more you practice, the easier it'll be for you to realize, like, this sounds like a base case and build type of problem. The final approach is what's called uh, data structure brainstorm. And I always leave this for the end because it's the one that I don't really like very much because problems that work with this probably shouldn't be asked. But it does happen. So I like to talk about it anyway. So data structure brainstorm means to basically go through all the data structures you can think of and say, what if I apply this data structure? What if I apply this other one? And the reason why it works is that sometimes finding a good algorithm is as simple as it occurring to you to use a particular data structure. So let me show what I mean. So this is a problem I actually used to ask at Google before I realized it was a bad question. But it's what I call the phone number problem. So this problem goes as follows. You're basically the person working at the phone company. And your job is to give out phone numbers. They're given out one of two ways. One is somebody comes in and says, uh, I'd like the number uh, 206-555-1359. Or they say, you know, you're, you have to sort of assign that to them if it's still available. Or they say, hey, I need a new phone number. I don't care what you give me. Just give me any phone number that works. And so the, the question is basically design these sort of data structure algorithms to be able to support both of these operations. And you only need to keep track of if a number is available or not. You don't need to keep track of who owns it. So if we apply data structure <coughs> brainstorm, we go through and think about the common data structures. First, well, what if we use a sorted array, which contained all the available phone numbers? Well, the problem there is that if you want to, if a, you want to sort of mark a number as no longer available, you have to remove it from the array, which requires shifting everything over. 
So that'll be pretty slow. Well, what if, you know, what if we have a linked list of all the available phone numbers? Well, the problem is there that finding a particular number is going to be slow. So what about a hash table? Well, you know, and the, this hash table would map from each number to, what, to true or false, depending on what that's available. Seems promising, except that there's no way to say, you know, to just iterate just through the, the numbers that, are, that map to true. So you'd have to go through every number and find and wait for something to map to true or false, depending on how you implement it. And that, that'll, when not many numbers are available, that'll get really slow. So mm, these aren't great solutions so far. What if, what if we use a binary search tree of all the available phone numbers? Well, as soon as we kind of think about, if you know what a binary search tree, and you think about this, is this is basically our solution. For a binary search tree of all the available phone numbers. If a number is, uh, if we need to find a particular phone number, we, it's a binary search tree, we can find that really quickly. If we want to find any available phone number, well, we just take any node from the tree. And this is basically our algorithm. And you know, it's, it seems like a really, really, really hard problem until you just find the right data structure and then it's basically done for you. So that's data structure brainstorm. Just go through all the common data structures and think about, does this one work, does this one work, does this one work? That's a high level overview of these other approaches. Uh, so pattern matching, simplify and generalize, base case and build, and data structure brainstorm. So there's two other types of problems that I'm not going to talk about today, but those are arbitrary design and system design. Uh, but you can, th there are, there's more about them in my book. Um, arbitrary design, just add on here, arbitrary design are super, super popular if you ever review Amazon. Uh, they're asked as, basically, I think actually there might be a rule that will get found it. So do make sure you prepare for those. System design are going to come up for, uh, Anything that's any, or most companies that are web-based will ask this. So, of the sort of you know the top tech companies, so Google, Amazon, I think Facebook asks them too. Um, so not every company will ask them. A desktop company isn't going to ask this in design. Um, okay, so those are the different types of questions. So again, I want to stress that a lot of people get really, really intimidated by this and think that this stuff is impossible. And again, I want to stress that you're just you're going to be compared relative to other candidates. So that means that it's no. You know, it, it's, it's no harder, you know, you get a harder question, you know, some people think like, oh my god, I got these really hard questions, or they'll be thinking, wow, I really hope I get easy questions in this interview. Easy questions are no easier to get an offer from, right? For the same reason that if your teacher gives you a test, a math test, whether the test is really easy or the test is really hard, the same percentage of people will always get in the top 10%. You'll always have 10% of people getting the top 10% of the test. Whether it's easy test or hard test, right? Same way with an interview. So getting hard questions does not 